For more than 40 years, UGA students have enjoyed the opportunity to study the art, architecture, and history that is the classical culture of Rome. It's really great seeing Rome from the perspective of everything at once. It's a really beautiful patchwork of every era up until, up until this one, and it's great seeing it meld together. major goals of a university education uh, is to present to students uh, a variety and a diversity of disciplines. History, art history, political science, religion, uh, architecture. The study abroad program, um, you're able to in fact demonstrate that. Um, you walk down a street in Rome and you point out uh, a temple from the second century AD, beautiful Roman building. Um, at the end of the block, um, there's a medieval fortress. Um, across the street, um, there is a Renaissance palace. Um, so you, I think, get a better understanding of the fact um, that this is a very organic uh, process of building history, um, that things are layered over one another, and that things uh, react to the environment around them. The first monument for today actually uh, ties in very closely um, to the material we were discussing in lecture, this transition from the end of the Julio-Claudian dynasty to the Flavian period. Um, and it is you know, very rightly called the Eternal City. Um, so one of the things that we hope to do in this uh, program is to communicate to our students why it's the Eternal City, why Rome is always relevant, um, how much of history um, has happened here. My hope is that, uh, that at the very least, um, students end up with a sense of the complexity of the fabric of Rome. The UGA threads in that fabric go back to 1970. In this, its 45th year, the Classic Study Abroad program in Rome is taking students to the ancient world and back, mostly within the walls of one amazing city. The program uh, started in 1970, so Dr. Best explained to me that uh, um, he had been uh, in Italy um, for uh, a trip on his own and he had loved it so much that uh, he wanted to take uh, his students along. And so I, um, I really think that it was a very courageous thing for him to do, to just uh, um, get it all organized. This was at the same time uh, Dr. Keo um, was uh, also doing a similar thing with uh, the Cortona program. And actually, if I understand it correctly, uh, the two programs started in the same year. I think that uh, uh, both programs uh, traveled uh, together uh, uh, on the same plane. As much as UGA has changed since 1970, its study abroad offerings have also grown by a factor of 12 since the Rome program began. While only a blip in the life of the city of Rome, the period has witnessed an unparalleled ascendance in the opportunities for UGA students, opportunities with long-lasting and ongoing impact. The program's instructor in 2014, Christopher Gregg, is himself an alumnus of the program and recalls his first experience in Rome. I, I was a, a classics major, um, studying classical civilization and taking Latin uh, as an undergraduate when I came on this program, um, which is what inspired me to come on the program. Uh, but after I came to Rome, uh, there was sort of a, a new certainty um, in my mind that uh, I was on the right path here. Once I experienced the city, uh, once I, I, I walked through the museums and walked through the sites like the Ancient Forum, um, I knew really without any doubt that 
this was the career that I wanted um, and that I wanted to do everything I could to be able to come back to Rome. Um, in fact, I, I, I somewhat jokingly but not entirely uh, in jest, say that um, my career has simply been um, the process of always uh, finding a new way to get back to Rome. Being in a classroom in Athens or Chapel Hill uh, and a certain sculpture would come up or a certain piece of architecture would come up, um, I would very often be able to say, ah, I've seen that, you know, in the flesh, you know, right in front of it. Um, and it's, it's really amazing the difference that makes. Uh, it sticks with you, um, it has more relevance, it's more concrete. Um, and there are quite simply things that you notice when you see something one-on-one uh, -on -one as opposed to seeing it projected on a wall um, that you would have never noticed in even the best slide or the best picture. While in the Eternal City, UGA students are out and about every day. From the Villa Borghese to Trastevere and the Genicolo, from the Spanish Steps to the Colosseum and the Palatine Hill. But in between, their home in Rome is the Hotel Ercole. The hotel is uh, uh, located in a very convenient place in Rome. We are close to the main train station. We are within walking distance to the very center of Rome. And uh, so it is, uh, um, this is really, this location is a little bit like an anchor for us. A full service hotel throughout the year the Ercole is situated in a historic building with all the modern conveniences of home, plus Tommaso. It is uh, a very family-oriented uh, hotel. Uh, the students uh, feel comfortable being here. They feel comfortable interacting with Flavio, who is the hotel owner, with uh, his daughter, with the various staff members. It's home! Oh, and I miss it right now so much. <laughs> uh, Flavio and Tommaso and everybody, they're just, they're great. And they're so welcoming, they're so helpful. They're willing to kind of do whatever you need them to. Um, home cooked meals every night really doesn't get any better. And it's like, my mom's here, but not really. <laughs> Living at the Ercole act is like they're the greatest. They take such good care of us, and like we get to, we spend. You literally get to learn Rome while walking it. Like Dr. Greg, he talked about the beginning. He's like, oh yeah, you guys will like be able to figure out the streets by the end of this. You'll know where you're going, and you'll be able to like use cognitive mapping. And I was like, are you kidding me? I have the worst with directions. It's something absolutely normal. If I don't have. Uh, the students, it seems to me that it's not summer. It was always nice because they're very friendly and also the teachers, very friendly, very close to us also, you know, we, we try to help each other. So for me it's nice to have the people here. The UGA students who attend the Classics program in Rome represent a diverse cross-section of the student body from across campus as well as geographically. Latin and history and social studies education. Physics and astronomy. Uh, and I'm a bio major. Art history major. Yeah. Classical culture. Anthropology. World language education and Latin. One of the great challenges uh, of this program, I think, for me as a professor and also, I think, for the students, is the incredible breadth of material covered. Um, again, our primary focus is on the ancient world, so looking at the monuments of the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire, uh, looking at the cultural influences that affected them. Um, but there's just too much in the city of Rome to limit ourselves. Uh, and um, while some programs you know, might 
create this artificial boundary and say, no, we're only going to look at uh, ancient Roman material because that's the only thing we're here to study. Um, a part of our curriculum is actually a course called The Urban Tradition, um, in which uh, we talk about all the different uh, phases of the city's history, um, from you know, the very, very earliest founding of the city um, and the geographic reasons why it was such a prime site for settling, um, all the way up to the uh, um, early 20th century, um, and in some cases later. Um, there are uh, the occasional contemporary buildings built in uh, the 2000s that we encounter, and visually they're very different from what we see uh, around us most days, so we stop and we talk about those as well. Um, but I think it's actually one of the great strengths of this program um, that we do pay attention to the periods beyond the, the ancient world. And while the ancient world that lies within the Aurelian walls of Rome is the primary focus of the program, the third week sees the group bid farewell to the comfy confines of the Hotel Ercoli for a trip down to the Bay of Naples. The three-day excursion to Campania began in the city of Naples with a visit to the National Archaeological Museum. Dr. Greg is, is very good and he, he teaches in a similar style to other classics professors that I've had, but he, he puts his own emphasis on things that he wants us to know like any other teacher would. And it's, it's great getting his perspective on things, especially having taken classes with Professor Anderson, who was his mentor. The most important archaeological museum in Italy the museum contains a large collection of Roman artifacts from Pompeii and Herculaneum, including works of the highest quality produced in Greek, Roman, and Renaissance times. This portrait style that, uh, that Vespasian chooses. Now, what kind of portrait style would Augustus have? What is all of them? That classicizing style, so very youthful, serene, ideal. For me, I've always loved ancient Rome. I came back to, I came to Italy five years ago and I've always been fascinated with it and I've been lucky enough that the three classics classes that we're taking are part of the history degree. It's exciting to be able to see different parts of Italy and then from like a modern perspective but then also to be able to see different ancient sites as well. Located in the shadow of Mount Vesuvius five miles to the southeast of Naples, Herculaneum is one of the few ancient cities that can now be seen in almost its original splendor. Unlike Pompeii, it was mainly affected by pyroclastic flows, thus preserving wooden objects such as rooftops, building beams, beds, and doors. A wealthier town than Pompeii, Herculaneum possessed an extraordinary density of fine houses and far more lavish use of colored marble cladding. Herculaneum was a seaside town up until 79 AD. The sea is now about three miles in that direction but that's due to geologic changes brought about by the eruption in 79 and subsequent geological activity in the area. The earliest phases of Herculaneum are rather opaque to us. We don't really know much about the founding of the city. Um, it probably happened sometime in or maybe before the 6th century BC. Down here on the Bay of Naples, the Italic people are called the Oscans, and it's likely that this city was originally founded by the Oscans. It's the city of Hercules, um, or Heracles to the Greeks, whose statue we just saw in the uh, archaeological museum in Naples. The explanation for this is uh, simply probably that the Oscans, like the Etruscans, like the Latins, are ultimately tremendously influenced by Greek culture. As we're going to see tomorrow, there are Greek colonies throughout this area of Italy, and at some point the 
Oscans or the other Italic peoples who settled here probably wanted to connect their own culture to this Greek culture, which in many ways was technologically and artistically and culturally superior. And so they actually adopt a Greek name for the city. The proprietor um, would stand out here. You would walk up as if it were a McDonald's walk-up window, um, and you'd say, I'd like a glass of wine, I'd like some fish sauce, I'd like some bread, um, and you would be given a meal. Um, so this is essentially the, the equivalent of uh, fast food in the Roman world. Paestum was a major ancient Greek city on the coast of the Tyrrhenian Sea. After its foundation by Greek colonists under the name of Posidonia, it was eventually conquered by the Lucanians and later the Romans. The ruins of Paestum are notable for their three ancient Greek temples, all in a very good state of preservation. Colonizing the Western Mediterranean, and especially the area of Sicily and Southern Italy, for over a century at that point, the earliest Greek colonies uh, in the West, in Italy, um, date to the early 700s. Um, the first thing I want to talk to you about in the museum um, are the sculptural reliefs. And in order to understand them, uh, we have to talk a little bit about Greek temple architecture, which is actually going to be a recurring theme today. So we have a landscape with very abstract trees, a grayish blue body of water, a built architectural tower, we can tell it's built because of those regular rectangular blocks, and a platform at the top of the tower off of which a male figure has leapt, diving into the water below, hence the tomb of the diver. It's Santa Maria of the Pomegranate, and so you see Mary holding the pomegranate, pomegranate. You get vases that have appliques on them. Like in the Hellenistic period, you get these brightly colored Call the profile of these Echinus capitals. Notice how at the upper part of the capital it has this distinctive rounded or curving profile. Now visited by millions of tourists each year, Pompeii was first rediscovered in 1599, but only a few artifacts were uncovered before interest in the site waned. Excavation began in earnest after the site was discovered a second time in 1748 and has continued to the present day. probably level it off just before you make a triangle, and that is the size of Mount Vesuvius pre-eruption. In that recovery effort, every single statue in the forum was removed. So we know that they were here because of the pedestals, but we don't have any of them. We have the nave and the side aisles, um, and here we have actually preserved very nice. Are you going to be the group leader? Will you tell us about Pompeii? You could... The table of weights and measures. Bless you. Adaptation. The Romans taking something from the early phase of the city, reusing it, but making it truly Roman in the process. <laughs> Thank you.
aquí se quita y tiene unos pendientes, pero un collar, cierta ropa y por el objeto que lleva sabemos que being able to see all the sculptures and previously that I have learned in class and seen on t on the the screen mm -hmm. seeing it in person is just so much better and different it makes it it makes learning way more interesting archaeology is one of the four main fields of anthropology and so like I've always enjoyed I've, I've always enjoyed classical culture, so I, this program, looking at it, it was very out in the field, so I get to actually see what archaeologists and classics, um, people who study classics have uncovered and how they've set it up. So it's kind of like I get to see the results of someone else's archaeological pursuits, which is really cool. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering if this appeals to the scientists and do it all. I mean, um, historically. Yeah, yeah. Archaeologically, it does very much so. But in terms of art, it's hard for me to really um, grasp and understand like all that stuff. But I really enjoy hearing about um, like archaeological methods and methodologies for excavation and stuff like that. It has been touristy, yet real life, because we are getting to travel to amazing places such as Naples and Pompeii, but we're also being able to enjoy Rome, not as an ancient city, as tourists, but also living in modern day city of Rome and all that it has to offer. I mean, how else are you going to get this kind of experience if you don't like go through these kinds of programs? Going out, not just uh, like to the normal places like Paris and England, but going and actually studying in a foreign country with a professor who knows like ridiculous amount of information about the stuff. I mean, you just can't, you can't get that kind of experience unless you go out study abroad like this. Um, curiously, from our elite Roman writers, um, we know that uh, elite Romans did not eat on the go. That it was considered to be the gauchest thing in the world um, to actually walk down the street eating or stand out in front of an establishment like this and eat. A good elite Roman reclined on his couch uh, always to eat. Um, name, rank, and serial number. <laughs> I'm um, Harris Burton from Rome, Georgia, and I'm a bio major. Biosciences? Mm -hmm. mm. So what's the connection with classics? Well, I took a Latin class this semester, this past semester, and Dr. Bian Kelly came to my class and talked about the program, and I'd always been interested in like ancient Rome and the culture and the mythology and all that cool stuff. And so when she came in and talked about it, I was just like, oh, that'd be kind of cool to go learn about it for real, taking classes in the city from Rome, so. You know, uh, Rome uh, is an uh, expensive city, as we said, but it is also, it's such a unique, uh, wonderful place. And uh, it uh, offers so many teaching opportunities. I don't know how to speak Italian. I say that in Italian to the Italian people, when they start going off at me, and I'm like, they're like, but you just spoke Italian. How, you said you don't know Italian in Italian. <laughs> Everyone is so different. We're all, you know, there's a couple sorority girls and then people who are different majors that aren't related to classics at all. So kind of get a well-rounded idea of what UGA is through other people that you get to become really, really good friends with, which is really cool to you. Rome and love. Roma, R-O-M-A, Amor, A-M-O-R the reverse of one another. Because they have learned to live, to manage a big city, but a big city which is, uh, uh, which offers all the challenges of a big city, but it is also comfortable. It's beautiful. It's, uh, and it's full of surprises. You can be here for weeks, months, years, and it will still surprise you. You will still find something that you have never seen before or something that you want to go back to over and over and over again.